Thanks very much. Um, a great uh, delight and honor to be here with uh, Mark and his friends and, and to meet Monica and uh, Bob uh, for dinner and Jean, Jean uh, Chen as well. I, I came, I was so eager to be here, I came a day early by mistake. <laughs> Arrived on Saturday afternoon and then Ryan last night. It's um, a great opportunity. Make sure it's the right dinner. Uh, what's needed? Um, I should say first uh, that uh, I've learned a lot from what I've heard this morning uh, so far, but we already know what's needed. All you have to do is look at the CASA study, for example, in terms of uh, the Columbia uh, Presbyterian study, instead in, and to look at the fact that the medical education system is totally broken or absent or deficient with respect to addiction and needs to be mended at the earliest opportunity. And uh, they've shrunk my first slide down uh, where I had uh, a humanitarian crisis in the United States. It's what we're facing, and, and uh, 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 Bertha mentioned the Manhattan Project, and that's, I think, an important uh, consideration to take. If we don't have something like that, nothing much is going to happen. I also had on that first slide, and obviously they're gone, and this is my important point that I want to make, that we talk about the brain, and the brain is certainly critical and important, but have you ever heard a brain-to-brain -brain conversation with anyone? And the heart and the soul are left out of this equation time and time and time again. And that is where the treatment changes really take place in, in Bob DuPont's uh, going on over five years and so on. It's the heart and soul, not the brain that are involved. And we have a program I work in, Mending Broken People, and call it Healing Wounded Souls, uh, Restoring Integrity, Recovering Passion, and Discovering Purpose. I think they are the goals, uh, wherever we go about them, and there are many paths to those goals. Many paths to those goals. Uh, <clears throat> we need to promote community-based recovery-oriented systems of care, uh, very important. They're abstinence-based. Coming along, research is in operation. Reconsider, I think, <clears throat> medically-assisted uh, treatment as the number one option for treatment of opioids dependence because it's too complicated, as has just been pointed out. It has a role, but it's a limited role in terms of what it is now. A massive barrage of co coordinated outcome studies. And Ryan, this is, I think, here where also uh, Rivermen can make a great, great, great contribution. And they haven't yet been done. And there, is, there are probably six ways to get sober and clean, and they should be identified. And then whole studies to compare uh, different treatment modalities. Ten cultures have to be integrated. We've mentioned all of them here this morning. Active addiction, transition, translational clinical neuroscience, corporate, nonprofit, public health, and so on, spiritual recovery, faith-based treatment, abstinence, long-term, short-term. All of these have to be put together, and there are representatives here of all of them, but we, and they are warring, as my last slide says, uh, a massive, um, a summit uh, to resolve and the warring conflict uh, between the various approaches to this profit, non-profit, and whatever, and the destructive competition. Now, this uh, gives a little bit of uh, my history here. Uh, I'm not a researcher at all. I use my personal experience and that of others uh, to uh, discern my, uh, you've got to put the clock on, please. Uh, oh. to <laughs> With that's, the, that's the way. That's the way to get a bonus. Two minutes. You see. <laughs> oh no! I haven't. I haven't been going for five minutes. No, no, that's unfair. Uh, defeated by my own thicker. I, 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 I'm a recovering alcoholic for 36 years. I came from an alcoholic family from a generation of alcoholics three generations back. Mother was alcoholic, father a heavy drinker. I became alcoholic. Um, I got sober in 1977, started my career in addiction, running a methadone clinic at Johns Hopkins for four years, another methadone clinic at the VA, UCLA, uh, for another two years after that. Um, and then I got sober, and uh, my whole family is sober. My wife has 28 years of sobriety. My youngest son is 27. My oldest son is 19 years of sobriety, and my granddaughter, who was missing for two and a half years in cults and jails and prisons everywhere else, is now running a sober living house about two miles from here. 
and uh, has 10 years of sobriety. And so we have managed to um, interrupt the transgenerational uh, transmission of this disease down through the generations and was stopped. Their children have never seen them drunk and so on. I'm very proud of all of that. Uh, I just happened to be the first in the tribe uh, that was lucky enough to get into recovery. You know all of these things, but I want to know with, with uh, simply uh, primary care physicians looking after addicts and whatever, how the hell are they going to deal with all of this stuff? Because this is what it's like. And these, these little asterisks you see beside them, that's me. Every one of those was me. And when I decided, you know, I began to become interested in suffering some ways into my, uh, into my uh, recovery, and I thought the best way to look at suffering is to look at concentration camps where the greatest suffering of all that in history, in written history, has ever taken place. So I did that. And I found that these are all documented, incidentally. When they came first, when the Jews came into the camps first, it was a courageous generosity. And it began to decline as the time went on and the, the terror increased and so on, and into these uh, negative things where people uh, would do anything in order to survive, including murder, including sacrificing their own relatives. And that's all, that's all um, documented. And then accompanied by a terrible shame afterwards, because nobody would believe what happened to them if they talked about it, so they couldn't talk about it. Deep, malignant shame, which is also, uh, I think, a very strong characteristic of addiction. And then, all, look at that slide. That's in the camps. All you have to do, that's addiction. I have showed that slide to 10,000 addicts or more now over the last five years, and 80% of the addicts can agree with agreeing with or with identifying with 10, with 80% of those issues. And I, I have, this is my way of trying to educate people how terrible it is to be an addict and what addicts have to do every day in order to survive mentally, physically, spiritually, and otherwise, and stop destroying themselves or others between nine and five every day, just like the people in the concentration camps. That was their only goal, and that is the only goal of an addict, me. Those, those um, asterisks, that's me too. That's my history. So I speak with that authority, not the authority of research, which I respect and love deeply, but from the authority of personal experience. And this terrible statistic uh, continues to go into recovery. It's a culture shock to move from addiction into recovery. When they came back, and this is all documented, particularly like Primo Levi in his book, uh, uh, If This Be a Man, and the dying, I mean, the drowned and the saved. Uh, how, do you, how do you tell people about your addiction? They wouldn't believe it if you said it, or they, they want to dispense with you and drive you away. We are like the lepers of the 21st century. That's part of the block as to why we don't do anything about it, because subtly, nobody wants to have anything to do with us. And when you tell them what, who it is we are, they want to have less to do with us, because all of these things are revealed. And all of these things have to be kept secret by the alcoholic and the addict as they are progressing. I always think that, you know, at the end of the, that, that, that recovering people should apply to the CIA to be covert agents, because we are great covert agents who are smart operators. And you see physical and mental disorders, relationship and work problems, they don't have, uh, and we go into the next slide here. Same thing, it's exactly the same slide in recovery, sobriety for the addicts. All of those things, we all deal with them on a daily basis with our patients, and they are, have, they are the sequelae, the leftovers, uh, from a life spent in stress and survival uh, over many, many, many years, uh, trying to deal with it all and get settled down and all of the rest of it. So I hope that, that, that here with this sophisticated audience, I don't know how many people are a bit surprised by this, but certainly other people are who are not as sophisticated as this audience. But I wouldn't be a bit surprised if quite a number of people here said, oh my god, I didn't know it was that bad. Because they've never really got down and dirty with us addicts and alcoholics. And in this sense, uh, you know, there's a blizzard of psychopharmacology now, a sort of tsunami of medications. Because the doctors, the unfortunate doctors, according to the CASA report, 
uh, 80%, 90% of doctors have never been trained or treated to recognize or deal with an addict. So they turn them into something else, a depressive person, an anxiety disorder, personality disorder. I call them the addictive lifestyle personality disorder. And in recovery, it's the recovery lifestyle personality adjustment. And that gets rid of all the, the access to stuff. You know, just those two designations, I think, would simplify everything very much. But the doctor's office, because the doctors don't know what to do, so they give medications. And we receive them in our treatment center. People coming in on five, six, seven, coming in with ECT, a 23-year-old girl last week with 23, with 12 ECTs last May, followed by three years of medications. All she needed was the prescription of a dog. I gave her a dog, and she's come out of her bereavement due to a relationship and not due to a major depression for which he was mistreated for four years. Sad. And that's happened in two months. I mean, the treatment and the, the recovery. So what, what works? AA, Humphreys and many others, Rudy Moose and others, Lode, Cascudas, out to 15, 17 years now, if you do the program. AA doesn't work if you don't do the program. You just go to meetings and have coffee and hang out doesn't work. You've got to do the program. And Bob DuPont is the great man with that. And he, I worked with pilots for 25 years and with doctors here in California. We know that very well. But it's hard to do the program. Uh, 90 days of treatment, that's Bob's study he's talked about with Tom McClellan. Recovery-oriented systems of care, sober-based, new professions coming up for recovering people who are numerous and, and prolific. Uh, Long-term, phase-based inpatient treatment, we have that. The treatment is about 10 months to 18 months. Uh, I work in a Jewish treatment center now in the Betuva, very successful. We want to do good outcome studies to show how successful, successful it really is. And then medication-assisted treatment, for which there is a big space, but it, without social um, help and facilitation, I believe that methadone is not terribly useful, except if you plug it into a program. And now NA will accept people on methadone or buprenorphine. Very important decision. And then finally, 12-step facilitation and uh, CBT, mindfulness, and DBT, and all the other things need to be developed. There are many other things, but they are the ones that came to mind. And it was a, a great challenge, as a matter of fact, to use 10 slides. I normally have 143 slides. 